In today's video, we're going back down the rabbit hole, though this time, I've managed to get a hold of one of their first flagships since the ancient Matrox Parhelia. Now this right here is supposed to be the new Matrox C680, which although not a new, new graphics card, is still relatively exciting given that it is a modern flagship from the one, the only, the legendary Matrox. Ordered straight off eBay for slightly under £40, these pop up occasionally often around this price. Some people try and scalp them for hundreds, but honestly, I've never once seen them sell. So anyway, I haven't had the time to actually get around to ordering these. I ordered this a little while ago, but eventually, you know, I did get around to ordering one, and it's now time to get around to unboxing it, because it's been sat here waiting around for us to test for uh, a little while now. Now this here appears to be the Matrox C680, one of the more powerful cards in the Matrox lineup, and for all intents and purposes, their flagship graphics card. But to do a little bit of a recap on who Matrox actually are, we're going to run over the story of them real fast. Now I do have a full series on Matrox for those who want a little bit more of an in-depth sort of analysis, but ultimately this is how we ended up getting here with the company Matrox. Originally, back in the early days of graphics cards, there was ATI, there was NVIDIA, there was 3DFX and the likes. But there was another competitor. No, not Intel, that is a video for another day. But Matrox, offering an alternative in the form of high quality, stable graphics cards. And in an era where everything was analog, it wasn't just graphics that mattered. No, it was the quality of the output that could make a world of difference. I mean, look at how much money people invest today into displaying retro consoles. Still, the idea for Matrox was they offered you the highest quality graphics output, and in my experience, you know, relatively stable cards. Primarily peaking in the late 90s, things went a bit wayward with the release of their G450 card, as people ended up not being too happy with it being sort of a rebrand of their older cards. There were a few changes, but not many. They were expecting something a little bit more. It wasn't a bad card, but it was the start of the end for Matrox, and they were really lagging behind in the world of performance. From here though, there was the final nail in the coffin, with the Matrox Parhelia, a card that I personally absolutely adore for all things retro, it was meant to be the big one, it was meant to have it all, it was meant to have the performance, the output, the drivers, the features, and you know, it was just meant to be brilliant, but when paired to the competition, it really couldn't match them at all for price, nor performance, and with DirectX 9 just around the corner, there was really no hope for the card. In my own video, I absolutely loved it. It was dead stable, not something you often find on these ancient cards, and the features, all oh, the features. You could do super sampling on an AGP graphics card. Years before any of the mainstream big players even considered that an offering, Matrox were offering it 20 years ago. So for the classics, it's brilliant. But at the time, it was a bit of a flop. You know, people just, you can go out and buy a Radeon 9800 you just go and buy that instead and you've got DirectX 9 and all that. There was just no reason to buy the card at the time unless you wanted those features. And it caused Matrox to leave the consumer market. This was until the release of the Matrox C420. In recent years, their low cost return to the consumer market. It was based on AMD hardware, and I was pretty blown away by what they were offering. It wasn't a pure Matrox card, but in spirit, it sort of carried on what they stood for. Stable drivers and a brilliant feature set, all in a small, convenient, power-efficient package. During my testing though, the frame times we saw were unimaginably smooth. Not AMD nor Nvidia can come anywhere close to the experience I had with the Matrox card when it came to stability. The frame times weren't always high, well, the frame times, the frame rates weren't always high, but everything was playable. You could, you could see a silky smooth 15 FPS. We had Red Dead Redemption 2 running, and that wasn't even hitting 30 FPS, yet it was playable because of the frame times. And... You know, you just don't see that with a lot of cards where the drivers can be hit and miss and the frame times spike up and it can be a complete load of nonsense trying to get them running. But that was impressive. Still, that brings us to their next card, the Matrox C680. And there is very little online about these. So it's about time we found out just what is the Matrox C680, how did it get here, 
and like their last release, is it actually any good? Released in 2017, the Matrox C680 appears to be based on an AMD architecture, this time the Cape Verde Pro GL variant, not one we often see in consumer cards, and to my knowledge, this is a GCN1 architecture, but one of the later versions of it. It comes with 512 shading units, 2GB of GDDR5 RAM running through a 128-bit memory bus, and operates within a maximum power envelope of 40 watts. More importantly, like their previous release, it supports DirectX 12 in full, and even has support for Vulkan. So in terms of day-to-day -day use, we've got a full feature set available to us. It does only output via DisplayPort Mini, of which there are six ports all supporting 4K. Bit excessive, but remember this is Matrox. Displays have always been a big thing for them even in the digital era. So for sub £40, there are some strange specifications. Now, the C680 was released a few years ago, and a lot of you are probably wondering why. Well, its main selling point was that weird display configuration, with support for six 4K displays. Combine this with classic Matrox reliability, and this makes for an ideal setup for those needing a big old display setup, maybe people running their own shops or a display stand, something like that. Thing is, with that AMD background, these things have very impressive OpenCL and DirectX capabilities, so if you're running game engines, Maya, anything like that, you could optimize those capabilities and it gave you a card ideal for development. Thing is, as we found out last time, these optimizations in workstation programs led to some interesting things in the world of gaming, such as what if you took AMD levels of performance, gave them some Matrox flair, and somehow ended up with one of the smoothest experiences on the market, at least on the low power segment like the C420 was, but this is a bit more. In the first instance though, it would not crash, and you know, it hardly used any power, and finally, three, well, it's just pretty good at the current price. So is this card going to be the exact same to use? We're using the latest version of the Matrox drivers, and that is also combined with a Ryzen 3700X and 32GB of DDR4 RAM running Windows 10 64-bit, just to find out what the real performance of the card is. So after we had this all set up, the only thing we had left to do was get everything ready and start running the benchmarks. Starting off the benchmarks, we have Counter-Strike 2, which isn't a game I've ever tested or benchmarked before, given that we usually end up testing CSGO. Now, I won't make any comments on the overall game, but the performance we saw was a good mixture of competitive settings in a 720p resolution, and it was more than solid, averaging around 90fps across a mixture of game modes and maps. Generally, these could be slightly higher in competitive situations, but were very map dependent. Some maps like Office could be well in excess of 100fps a lot of the time, whereas other really intensive maps like Italy would hover around the 60-70fps to 70 FPS mark. But across the board, the game was always playable with exceptions exceptional frame times. There weren't any hitches or stuttering regardless of what was going on, and even the new intensive smokes, well, they hardly seemed to hit the frames, at least not as badly as I was expecting them to. Next up was one of the big ones, with Red Dead Redemption 2 running in 720p with a mixture of low and medium settings. Now this game did recommend we go out and download the latest AMD drivers, something which of course we can't do, so these drivers from Matrox which have no specific optimization for the game will have to do. However, even with these downsides, the game hovered around a perfectly playable 30fps. This was the same as when in combat and a variety of other situations, and it did take a little while to tweak these settings to work, as some things would impact the card a lot more than others, possibly due to the optimizations, possibly due to the card. Still, overall, Red Dead Redemption 2 not just running this time, but completely playable on a Matrox graphics card, something that I didn't think we would ever see. Beam 
RNG was an interesting one, as I know lots of people like me benchmarking it, but I had to do two sets of benchmarks across a lot of maps just to get these figures down. As some of them proved really absolutely fine on the card, the game would run them with a nice mixture of settings ranging from high and tweak down to medium low depending on where the effect was on the frame rate, and it ran absolutely fine with around 40ish FPS and no slowdown for the vast majority of testing. But there were certain maps that the card just really struggled with. The settings had to be turned all the way down to the very lowest just to keep the frame rate high. It was fully playable and there was the standard matrix, you know, frame times where there was just no hitching or slowdown, but it was trying to get that frame rate up to that playable point that took a while. Still, it was very stable while doing so, and it was a very decent experience. It just depended on what maps you were running. Some absolutely fine with high settings, others you have to go down to the very lowest. There was no rhyme or reason for it as some maps that I thought, you know, this will be intense, absolutely fine, and some maps that shouldn't have been, you know, you're stuck with the lowest settings. Doesn't make any sense there, but it was always playable. Fallout 4 is another game that people are asking to have tested again, uh, for the life of me I can't figure out why, and after all of these years I can still confirm that the game generally runs fairly badly, even on the Matrox card. There was no point even attempting to achieve a solid 60fps as the game just wouldn't do it. However, with a nice mixture of medium settings in the 900p resolution, we could get around 30fps across indoor and outdoor settings. Usually in my testing the frame rate would shoot up indoors, but here on the C680 it just chugged along at a very respectable 35fps, rarely moving away from this figure even when things picked up. So stable, which is nice for a Bethesda game just you were never going to see high frames in a game like this. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord ran very well with a 720p high definition resolution, and of course a good mixture of settings, mostly using medium and some high settings and then adapting them down to low from there. We went straight into testing the game across a variety of larger battles just to push the card to some of the more extreme scenarios, and it had no problems doing so at all. For much of the early game the card will be in well excess of 60fps, but even towards the later stuff where some things can get hindered, you know, there was no problems here. When things get intense, there is no problems playing this game on the Matrox C680, and it runs really good as well. To give the other end of the scale, I did launch Half-Life 2 in 1080p full high definition with ultra settings, and the game defaulted to a solid 60fps, never dropping more than one fps beneath this. This is really making this card a solid contender for older classics, especially given that it's using absolutely no power at all while doing these, it's not even getting warm. The same can be said about a lot of other titles from this era, where you can absolutely just max them out and won't lose any frames. I'm fairly sure that there's some sort of V-Sync being enabled here, possibly in the background of the drivers, as it didn't seem like the game had V-Sync enabled in any of the settings menus, trust me I looked. But you know what, 60fps occasionally dropping to 59, I don't think you're ever going to complain with this. So there wasn't a single hitch and those older titles completely playable. Now this does also extend the other way up to remasters of classic titles like Skyrim Special Edition, which saw itself running with almost parity to the console versions of the game. Using high settings and a 900p resolution, the card returned a very playable 30fps overall and ran very much the same as Fallout 4 possibly slightly better given that we're using slightly nicer settings. It's no surprise given that they're more or less the same engine underneath, but it did also have some issues like Fallout with hitting a constant 60fps with the game, you know, just hitting shy of it and just not feeling quite right, so I just turned up the graphics settings and just went for a nice smooth 30fps, because on this Matrox card it is guaranteed to be smooth apparently, so there shouldn't be any problems there. Now I don't think anyone has ever tested things like 3D Mark here, where overall we got a score of 568 on the graphics card, placing it around sort of a HD 8670, sort of 8770, that OEM tier from AMD which is a bit weird, but makes sense given it's a weird card, it's not too bad. And it isn't exactly reflective of the performance we saw above, because this thing has outperformed cards like that easily. And it's probably because this card is so geared towards the stability rather than out and out performance. There's no boosting or anything like that going on here in these sort of limited benchmarks. The card just remained very stable with clocks not fluctuating once on the core or the memory. So 
very stable. It's really quite impressive for such a little card, so maybe not one for pushing benchmark numbers, but for the overall stability and general use, 3D Mark does echo what we saw. You're just not going to lose frame rates and you're just going to keep a steady experience throughout. Overall, that experience seemed very much like the last Matrox card we had on the channel, with performance that was absolutely unparalleled when it came to frame times and smoothness. Yes, the hardware underneath is a little bit dated, but for such a strange and quirky card, I really can't complain one bit. Thermals were decent of course, with the card rarely ever heating up, nor the fan ramping up either. At this point I hadn't even bothered to change the thermal paste, as strange enough the paste on there hadn't really dried up. Usually when I get one of these cards in for testing, the card's thermal paste is non-existent. But in this case, didn't really need anything done to it. No maintenance, nothing like that. Maybe at some point in its working life it's been changed, but I very much doubt it. Chances are they probably use some higher quality thermal paste out of the factory, knowing that these things don't ever seem to be built to break. And from my time as a technician, I know that Matrox, well, they'll answer your support questions even when cards like this are out of warranty, or even out of manufacture, mostly because they have a good degree in faith in them working. Good luck trying that with any of the big players in the market who forget about you the moment you've bought the bloody card. Power consumption was very, very low. Under the most intensive scenarios, the card would often run at around 31 watts. No, that's not a joke. With this thing being fully stress tested, we hardly even broke the 30 watt barrier. No wonder this thing will simply never break. It doesn't even warm up. Pretty impressive to see how the GCN architecture works when the company behind it doesn't just shove a ton of voltage into it and call it a day with the three extra frames that it achieved from doing so. Well done there. Stability was also brilliant, there was never any issues with the card or its performance. You could keep this thing chugging along and nothing you could do would make it stop. You could not get this thing to crash. I tried changing the resolution from 4K down to 640x480 and then leaving one screen interlaced and then changing it back and forth all over the place. Nope, no issues, no slowdown, nothing. I am asking this thing to do things that would often make my graphics driver just want to stop working. Interlaced signals and modern PCs don't go down well, this Matrox card handles all that and multitasks and just does it fine. It just works. So there we have it, the Matrox C680. And you know what? Once again I am impressed. For a card you can get for between 30 to 40 pounds, it seems like ridiculously good value for those needing a real workstation card that can also handle some games. And I don't just mean basic ones either, I mean some really quite modern stuff here. And it's always fun to test something that isn't from AMD or Nvidia. Sometimes it's nice to look at the market and imagine a more diverse time, where there were these little niches and nuances to each option, and no, Matrox aren't as big as they used to be, but the way I see it, we're two cards into their new lineup on this channel. And they're just as relevant for all the right reasons. It's more than just a rebrand and different enough to warrant what the name stands for. I hope you've all enjoyed watching this rather positive look back at the Matrox C680, and maybe someday we'll be able to get our hands on their latest Luma series they've just released. For now though, that's all. Good night.